Hello, my dear friends. We are going to read the diary of German Major Ernst Ponat, who fought on the Eastern Front as the commander of the 1st Battalion of the 22nd Infantry Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division. This division was engaged in fierce defensive battles in January-February 1942 near the town of Maga, not far from Leningrad. This diary was kept by the battalion commander, which makes it especially valuable. These notes reveal the organization of the German defense, the supply of the army, and the interrelationships among the officers. Also, he, as a battalion commander, often had to make manpower decisions as a result of the constant casualties amongst the officers. Altogether, this is a riveting diary of the everyday life of German officers on the Eastern Front. Now let's begin. January 1st, 1942. I slept until 12 p.m. today. At lunchtime, it was a roast. Our tank lights are on. It's a bright, painful-to-the-eyes light. Colonel Chadiers was awarded the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. It's a great joy. After lunch, Senior Lieutenant Passe arrives and presents me with an assault badge. In the evening, a Christmas parcel from Laura arrives at 6 p.m. I go by sleigh to the Major. There was so much to tell each other. At 12 p.m., I return by sleigh back. It is negative 38 degrees Celsius. There are still a lot of parcels at home. January 2nd. In the evening, we are going with a comrade to the positions. The machine guns are not shooting because of frost. January 3rd. I slept for a very long time. I wrote a lot of letters and read some very interesting books. I received both of these books from Gora. I found some lice on me. It was confirmed in the evening. I am quite discouraged. The second company has to abandon its positions, for there is supposed to be a rotation. In the evening, the second company is withdrawn from its positions. Everything is quiet on the front line. January 5th. We take up a new large dugout with two windows. It is first-rate daylight. I received two letters from Laura, the most recent dated December 12th, and received also photographs. All is quiet in the advanced positions. January 6th. I made a visit to the second company. It is pretty listless. Not enough cheer. I wrote a big order for a rotation. The parcels with presents have arrived. There are some rather entertaining things among them. A couple of them were brought to our dugout. January 7th. The front line remains quiet. There are many communication breakdowns. We use sleighs instead of automobiles. January 8th. In the evening, we went with the colonel round the positions. The position seems as if we would pull back here and give up the front fortifications. It would be very crappy. In the evening, the Russians are attempting to attack us. January 9th. Lieutenant Gerlo was again seconded to the supply wagon, which is now moved from the village of Shapki to the village of Petrovo. There is a reorganization of truck loading going on. The trucks will no longer deliver supplies from now on. It is bad for the horses. All the time, five of them die. I read a great deal now. January 10th. This evening, the second company replaces the third company. It is very calm. I was reading very much. Handing out the presents, pencils, lighters. In the evening, I went round our positions, handed out iron crosses to the men. January 11th. It is Sunday. There is no correspondence. The Russians act quietly. They build dugouts in a hurry on the front line and in the rear. The weather is mild, with only a 10 degree Celsius cold and a slight fall of snow. January 14th. The 3rd Company replaces the 2nd Company, and the 9th Company of the 43rd Infantry Division replaces the 1st Company, and so a quiet routine rotation begins. The soldiers are awarded the Iron Crosses in bulk. All of the old soldiers also received them. The colonel is back from his leave, and on January 13th went with me to the positions. There was still nightly light mortar fire, and also flanking machine gun fire from the left. The 1st Infantry Regiment sweeps everywhere along the trenches. The letters are still missing. The food supply is good. People in the front lines are short of bread. It is hard to obtain building material to build the positions. The artillery fires only under special orders. We have difficulties with ammunition. The horses have a very hard time. A movie number three was filmed here. January 17th. The building of the second defense line begins. At night, a colonel telephoned me. General Kleffel took command of the 50th Army Corps. General Grazi is the commander of the 1st Infantry Division. 
General Field Marshal von Reichenau has died. Klug, Lieb, Kleist, and Guderian are enlisted in the reserve. Kuchler commands Army Group North. Feldwebel Gamstein from the second company was promoted to the rank of lieutenant. Early in the morning, there is a farewell of General Kleffel with the commanders at the headquarters of the 1st Infantry Regiment. We have dinner and coffee together with my returned officers, Mitzel from the 3rd Company, Lieutenant Dottawa from the 1st Company, Vendig from the 2nd Company, Senior Lieutenant Newman, who is acting commander of the 4th Company, Lieutenant Gamscheid, Lieutenant Gerlog, Physician Gris, Unterfeld Wedbel Gilcher. At about 1500, we unexpectedly receive orders for a rotation. The rotation is supposed to happen between 6 p.m. and 2.30 a.m. We are replaced by the 1st Battalion of the 43rd Infantry Regiment. Our battalion, except for the 2nd Company, withdraws as divisional reserve to an encampment behind our field kitchens. By 6 a.m. on January 19th, we are expected to have already marched out. At 4 a.m., we arrived in camp on a march. January 19th Thank God we are positioned very well. All of us are so far in full readiness to march. Two horses died again. At about 12 a.m., I made my rounds to all the battalion positions. I live by myself in a rather cold dugout. In the evening, I receive a message from division headquarters that we probably are not going to be put into combat. The word has it that we are in big trouble to the east of the village of Shopke. In the evening, there was a meeting of company commanders. I sorted out a dispute between Till and Vendig. The electricity has been restored. There are still no letters from home. The last letter was dated December 26th. My stove is very badly heated. It is such a shame that we have had to leave our almost wholly equipped and settled positions. In January, we built a common dugout. January 20th The midway wagons passed before lunch. The men had done a great job and settled well. At about 2 p.m., I received an order from the division to march. As a reserve of the 18th Army Corps, we marched to the town of Maga. The march was appointed for 4.30 p.m., I leave the regimental headquarters in a wagon with Gerlo and Gris. The emplacements in Maga are quite well prepared. There is even a stable for the horses. At about 10.30 p.m., the first units arrived. At about 1.30 a.m., the last wagons arrived. It is between 32 and 34 degrees Celsius cold. I had a talk with the treasurer of the regimental headquarters. The cold is very bad. There was a bombardment at 5 a.m., two men wounded and one killed. January 21st. It is Wednesday. I woke up at about 11.30 a.m. It was reported that there were several men frostbitten with first and second degree frostbite. I inspected the stables and dugouts. The dugouts are quite cramped, so they are warm. It is acceptable to live. The stables are cold, dirty. We need to move the horses to another place. January 22nd. At about 10 a.m., the headquarters veterinarian arrived. The horses of the 3rd Company and wagons with ammunition were sent to Petrovo, because the stables are better than ours there. Everything else is quiet. The 18th Corps does not undertake anything with us yet. In the evening, we went for a walk together with the treasurer of the regimental headquarters. He lives near me. January 23rd At 10 a.m., Senior Lieutenant Sessa, adjutant of the regiment, arrived. The enemy planes were attacking. They shelled us with machine gun and cannon fire. At about 11 a.m., I went over and inspected the new stables. They are now fit to be used. I received a message that Senior Lieutenant Sessa had been mortally wounded while returning. A machine gun dropped from his wagon and shot him in the chest. He died on the spot. The funeral is appointed for tomorrow. January 24th. At 11 a.m., there was a funeral service for Senior Lieutenant Sessa. The colonel, who represented the division commander, gave a speech. The priest in ceremonial vestments was also present. It was very cold, about 30 degrees Celsius. A strong wind was blowing. On the way back, I overtook Gez and Baca. At 12 a.m., we had a joint dinner, which lasted until 6 p.m. There were eight officers assembled. I still have no letters. Yesterday, I was bitten by bedbugs. I ventilate my bed, sprinkle powder on everything. It's boring. There are few books. Between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., the electricity is on. Each evening there is a bombardment. February 4, 1942. I continue to live at Major Boom's command post. This is the 1st Ski Battalion of the 428th Infantry Regiment. 
the battalion carries out a variety of easy missions and is always on full alert. I would sweat with fear thinking that our positions would surrender and my headquarters would be cut off from the battalion. Our dugouts are still being built. The Russian attacks are quite hard again. This evening I receive a big parcel that the colonel has received from Laura. I cannot find a place to unwrap the parcel. February 5th. The spirited attacks of the Russians continue. Our casualties so far are 185 men. The attacks are continually ceasing. The Russians pull back to the right towards Boom's battalion. We are under fire from tanks and anti-tank guns. Lieutenant Ganas gets a direct hit in his dugout. Lieutenant Ganas is killed. Fervel Frankel and Gefreiter Karchis, the clerk, are also dead. I was at the time in Lieutenant Till's dugout and was the only one who was not wounded. Fervel Boronat arrived and reported that the entire command and control unit of the 4th Company had been knocked out. Fervel Boronat took command of the 4th Company until Senior Lieutenant Newman returned from the convoy at the village of Belovo. In the evening, Lieutenant Colonel, commander of the 833rd Infantry Regiment, under whose command we are, telephoned me and informed me that I was already a major from now on. Reich is also. He is in command of the 2nd Battalion. I was absolutely amazed. In the evening, I went around the positions. All the guys congratulate the newly minted major. February 6th. In the evening, we resettled in a forest dugout, staying there with ten liaisons. We had to leave the outpost of the company of the 1st Battalion of the 428th Infantry Regiment. The attack group of the 1st Company is assigned as a scolding. They return through a true scorcher. Everything else is all right. February 7th. It was quiet at the beginning. The weather was mild. It seems to be the calm before the storm. We are still in cramped dugouts. The new dugout is still being built. I have no shoulder straps. We continuously send out reconnaissance detachments to our rear in order to fight the partisans. There's not much progress, not many enemy defectors either. The Russians have left us in peace. Only at night they fire insignificantly at the supply men. February 8th. The Russians attack vigorously. At 11.30 a.m., Major Boom's report is that they have surrendered stronghold number one. Feldwebel Echel, with the attacking detachment of the first company, is sent out by me to put things right. Together with the attacking detachment of the first company of the 333rd Infantry Regiment, they retook the stronghold again. Fifteen men from the stronghold number one, this is the 1st Battalion of the 423rd Infantry Regiment, fled from there with their commander and abandoned all their weapons. In the evening, Colonel Shadis arrived after my earlier attempt to draw Lieutenant Colonel Time to the front positions. Only when he found out that Shadis was here, he arrived as well. That was my victory. The situation with letters and supplies is good now. The Russians are firing rocket mortars. There are two killed on the left. Lieutenant Ottawa is wounded. The first company is commanded by Senior Fervebel Echo. Senior Lieutenant Newman took command of the fourth company. Teal was given the rank of captain. The order comes into effect on February 11, 1941. February 9th. We move into a new dugout. It was prepared only by 12 at night. There are negligible attacks at the front. The artillery is doing a good job. February 10th. It is Tuesday. At 1 a.m., after moving to the new dugout, adjutant of the 333rd Infantry Regiment, Senior Lieutenant von Barken, and one captain arrived with a bottle of cognac. Together with Gerlo, we had a celebration in honor of the new dugout, which lasted until 4 a.m. In the afternoon, there were three negligible attacks. At about 2 a.m., the partisans attempted to break through. Lieutenant Bendik fell ill. The second company is commanded by Lieutenant Genstedt. In the evening, we ate with the company commanders the contents of my parcel and celebrated the new dugout. We also celebrated a promotion in rank. February 11th. The mission of the 333rd Infantry Regiment, undertaken to fight the partisans, was not successful. Not enough bravery. We take up an all-around defense. It became a large encampment with about 100 men in the rear. We had no casualties. Despite the fact that the partisans are supplied at night by transport planes, they are now devouring the human flesh. In the evening, a totally starved, wounded defector came to us. That's enough. He's done with the war. February 12, 1942. The Russians fired heavily on our positions in the rear. 
the rocket mortars fired a salvo at the village of Vinyagalovo, where the field kitchens were on the way. Three horses are killed, eight men are wounded, one commander is killed. The aviation is bombarding. The rocket mortars are firing at their own partisans behind the second company. I am going to award Echo the Knight's Cross. I am sending an attack unit of first company to the partisan camp. Between 1 a.m. and 5 p.m., the strongest fire raids by the Russians occur. They often hit our forest edge. There were three unexploded shells that hit the forest dugouts and shattered the windows. At night, after the heaviest fire raid, it becomes quiet. The machine gun suppressed a Russian anti-tank gun and a radio station in the dugout. That evening, I went to the position of my battalion. There were not many losses. It is reported that on the left, eight tanks showed up. The diary ends here. The defense of the German forces was crushed by the Red Army. The exact destiny of the author of the diary is unclear, but he did not survive the war. That is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, remember to give it a like and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, until new meetings.